Everyone ready? This is it. Okay. Um, my name is Eva Kim, and I am a summer undergraduate research fellow at the Copper Lab, where I am helping to investigate the neural basis of prosociality. So first things first, prosociality. What is it? Well, if we look at the Oxford Dictionary, it is relating to or denoting behavior that is positive, helpful, and intended to promote social acceptance and friendship. Examples of this would include empathy, helping behavior, compassion, heroism, and altruism. You may or may not have seen this picture floating around the internet. On August 16th, 1996, the three-year-old boy in this picture got away from his mother and fell 18 feet into the gorilla enclosure below. Onlookers, fearing that the gorillas would attack him, watched, no, is there feedback here? Um, watched horrified as the motionless boy was approached by Binta Jua, the gorilla shown here. She defied expectations by not only protecting the young boy from all the other gorillas, but also carrying his unconscious body 59 feet to an access entrance so that zoo personnel could tend to him. He eventually made a full recovery. When we hear about heroic stories like these, we can't help but wonder, why did she say that? So significance. Why is it important to study prosociality? Well, in the abstract viewpoint, we need to study prosociality to address the question of why do we care for one another? How did behavior that is positive, helpful, and promotes social acceptance and friendship evolve in a world where everyone's goal should be to selfishly promote their own genes? And only the fittest shall survive. The answer to this question could change our view of evolution itself. Or for a more practical and intuitive perspective, why do some people care and others not care? For those suffering from social diseases, the research into the neural basis of prosociality could prove very beneficial. An example of a social disease would be autism, symptoms of which I've listed here, but three that I would like to highlight. Those suffering from autism display indifference, do not play with other children, and can do some things very well, very quickly, but not tasks involving social understanding. You can clearly see how studying where prosociality is in the brain might help society as a whole to better understand diseases like autism. So what is our goal? If you haven't heard me say it enough, it is to study the neural basis of prosociality. And how are we going to do that? Using the rat model. Now, most studies are usually done in mice, but mice actually haven't been shown to care for one another. In fact, only in a recent paper by Bartolotol was it discovered that rats can care for one another. Before, such behaviors were thought to only exist in primates. Now at this point, you might be asking yourself, how does studying a rat's brain relate to humans? Well, the short answer is that rats and humans share similar brain biology. And since it is not ethical to surgically explore the human brain for research, the rat seems like a good alternative. That was a joke, you can laugh. <laughs> so, what do we already know? As mentioned earlier in the paper entitled Empathy and Prosocial Behavior by Bartol et al., a dominant rat intentionally learned how to free its cage mate. The paper showed that empathy is already established naturally, but the rat had to learn how to free its cage mate from the restrainer over the course of the experimental period. It's important to note we didn't teach or they didn't teach it to care. That care is already established. It just learned how to open the restrainer. The dominant rat did not open the restrainer when it was empty or when it contained an inanimate object. The researchers then thought that the expectation of playing with its trapped cage mate might lead to the dominant rat opening the door. But even when social contact was prevented, the rat still freed its cage mate. Look, yay! <laughs> When researchers put the trapped rat in competition with some trapped chocolate, they found, yeah, no, this is highly desirable, highly desirable for rats and humans. They found that the dominant rat would first free its cage mate, and then they would release and share the chocolate, which is 
Yeah, that's definitely like an aww moment. Go ahead. En enjoy this graphic. It was quite fun to make. It. And um, I ate some chocolate while looking at it. I was inspired. So, what is our hypothesis? Our hypothesis is that these kinds of behaviors can be found in the limbic system, which has been shown to be involved in emotion, behavior, motivation, long-term memory, old fashion, which is smell, and it seems to be primarily responsible for our emotional life. More specifically, we believe that the amygdala is involved in prosociality, the basal lateral amygdala in particular, because it contains neurons that respond to faces, and it is where sensory and social information become integrated, which can in turn facilitate learning. What that means is that the BLA is most likely the place in which the rat, after seeing and hearing the trapped rat's distress, understands that it needs to help and tries to figure out the trap. So it's a good place to start looking. So how are we planning to explore the question? We will be using three methods. Behavioral experiments, ultrasonic vocalizations, and optogenetics, all three of which will be discussed in the following slides, so don't worry. Testing behavior. How do we set up the experiment? First things first, we paired the rats for two weeks before beginning the behavioral trials. This allowed them to get comfortable with one another and establish dominancy, which is a natural behavior in rats. The first thing is we put the dominant rat, or the one that's more exploratory, bold, and more likely to try to free its cage mate, into the arena alone for 10 minutes. Um, that way it has plenty of time to explore and you know, just check out the area and get used to it. The second step is to place the submissive rat, or the one that's more passive, into the restrainer in the middle of the arena, as you can see here. Here is a short video demonstrating the behavior. Hold on. Demonstrating the behavior. Yeah, you can clearly see he's working real hard to try to open the door. No doubt about it. We then note the time at which the submissive rat is released, and if the submissive rat is not released in 40 minutes, then the experimenter half opens the door so the one on the inside does not learn helplessness. Oh, more animations. Eee. So what have we found so far? Take a look at this graph. On the y-axis, it is the time it took the dominant rat to open the door as measured in minutes. On the x-axis, it is the experimental trial day. You can see that on day one, rat one, did not quite understand the task and I had to open the door, or half open the door and it got itself out. Day two, same story. But day three, you can see a dramatic decrease in the time that it takes the dominant rat to open the door. Over the rest of the course of the testing period, you can see a few ups and downs here and there, but the overall shape of the curve clearly shows that the rat learned how to free its cage mate. Rats two, three, and four follow a similar pattern. But this fifth rat, for whatever reason, either opened the door immediately or not at all during the trial period. <laughs> Yeah, that was fun. This makes him a good candidate for optogenetics, but I'll explain that in a little bit. So, another method we can use to explore the question is to look at the emotional state of the rat. To do that, we used spectrograms, an example of which you can see here. There's sound frequency on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. The bright pink is the rat's ultrasonic vocalization. There are two types of ultrasonic vocalizations, as you can see here. And as a gauge, this is the threshold for human hearing. You can clearly see that these bright pink, like blotches, or beautiful figures and structures, are clearly above what we can physically hear. The first one is the appetitive or happy vocalization, which is usually found around 50 kilohertz. The second one is the aversive, or stress vocalization, which is usually around 22 kHz.
after we downsample the vocalizations, you can hear the clear differences between these two calls. Now, these are very quiet, and you all have been very quiet, but be extra quiet so you can hear these things. It's really cool. So here is the um, appetite or happy vocalizations. Yeah, almost like a bird whistle, right? And then um, this is the aversive or stressed vocalization. Yeah, you can definitely hear. It's like almost like screaming, like, oh my gosh, get me out of here! Help me! Who wouldn't want to help that? These results show exactly what we predict. The rats are making happy noises, 50K, during baseline play behavior, and stress vocalizations, around 22K, during baseline restrainer behavior. Now the third method that we can use is optogenetics. What is it, and how does it work? Well, scientists discovered a protein in algae which responds to light, as you can see here in this video. They have since found the gene that codes for that protein, called opsin, which is a light-sensitive ion channel. When stimulated, the channel opens, which fires an action potential. The promoter then drives expression of that gene. The construct is then inserted into a virus, which replicates and is then injected into the area of interest, in our case, the basal lateral amygdala. The virus will then express the protein so that we can selectively stimulate the BLA using light to see if the basal lateral amygdala is related to pro-social behavior. Cool, right? There's a whole video at Nature if you're interested in how their explanation of the entire process. So what we are working on now, and hopefully over the next semester, is to be able to shine light through a fiber optic cord into the rat's brain at the basal lateral amygdala when it is outside of the area of interest, which is highlighted by this green box. Hopefully, this will encourage the rat to engage with the restrainer more frequently to better the chances of freeing the trapped cage mate. What do we expect to see? This is an idealized learning curve for a particular behavior. After the implementation of light stimulation via optogenetics, we expect to see that the learning curve will either shift to the left or the curve will change shape entirely into a steeper drop. Both of these changes means that it should take the rats fewer experimental days to learn how to open the restrainer. This would apply to rats who learn the task, mainly rats 1 through 4 of the original data set. Now I promised to talk about Rat5 and how his data is particularly interesting for our research. As you can see here, I've isolated his data so that you can see how he's on polar opposites of the task, in terms of the task. He either opened the door immediately or not at all. If using optogenetics can help rats like him by stimulating him to remember not only to care for his cage mate, but to try to open the door then we can show that the basal lateral amygdala is involved in prosociality. And potentially, we can use this technique to further explore the social brain. I'd like to take this time to thank the Coffer Lab for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this project, and the Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship for giving me the funding to pursue this project. Thank you.